Welcome, dorks. I'm your co-host, Scott Solomon, here with Kelly Wiener-Smith. And uh, today we have a, a really great um, uh, set of guests for you that we'll get to in just a minute. Uh, but before we do that, I uh, just want to briefly go through the way that this works if, if you're new to dorks. Um, so basically, the way that we're going to run our um, our presentation today is we have uh, a couple of guests that are going to give presentations and uh, after each one we'll have some time for questions and answers and we encourage you to submit any questions that you have that you'd like them to answer through the Q&A function which is uh, something you should see at the bottom of your screen so the chat won't work but the Q&A uh, tool will allow you to submit questions and then Kelly and I will um, ask our hosts, our, our, excuse me, our panelists, as many of those questions as we have time for. And then at the very end, um, if we still have some time, we will try to kind of bring it all together and, um, and have a time for asking questions to, to both of our, our guests today. All right. Kelly, did I miss anything there? No, no, it sounds good. I'm excited. All right. Well, we also like to uh, invite uh, both our, our guests as well as uh, all of you, all of our, um, our attendees to join us in a drink. So, you know, if we were all together in person someplace, we might all be uh, sharing drinks and, and toasting to our dorkiness. But since we're all uh, in different places, we in advance like to share a um, cocktail and a mocktail that we invite you to prepare in advance and, and join us for. So um, I'm drinking the cocktail this week, which, you know, sometimes simple is best. And we've had a few kind of more complicated cocktails in some of our previous gatherings. But uh, this week, in part because of our theme of disease, uh, we thought we'd go with a simple but really good classic gin and tonic. So that's what I'm drinking. And, and Amber's um, drinking it, it well. looks like Amber, are you also drinking the gin and tonic? I am. I'm, I'm a big fan of my G&T. Well, uh, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> so, you know, one of the reasons we thought a, a gin and tonic was appropriate is, uh, as, as you may know, um, tonic water typically contains quinine, and that is an ingredient that um, has some medicinal properties. It actually uh, was originally used as a way of both preventing and treating malaria. And um, so, you know, the gin and tonic became a popular drink um, during the uh, British occupation of India. And um, so that is kind of part of how it gained its, uh, its reputation for being a medicinal drink, so to speak, and its popularity. So um, cheers to uh, preventing some malaria here. How many of us have, have taken quinine at some point not, for malaria? Not quinine, but I have taken um, chloroquine, which I guess is related to quinine. Yeah, yeah, my mistake. That's right. That is what I took. Is, does quinine also do the like weird dreams or is that chloroquine in particular? Yeah, there's another medication. So I think what happens is a lot of the malaria parasites, um, they actually can acquire resistance. They can evolve resistance to um, medications like chloroquine. And when that happens, you have to switch and take a different medication. So I've been a few places uh, where there's malaria that has evolved resistance to um, chloroquine and then had to take other medications um, and so there's one called mefloquine that has a reputation for having some side effects that can include really vivid and, and sometimes disturbing dreams, which um, I haven't had that side effect from it, but I know some others that have. So have, have, have any of you guys taken some of those malaria meds? I, I took um, the few times that I've had to go on um, pre-exposure for malaria was I, I had to take that into consideration. So I was just on some doxy as a as a preventative. Um, but the the dream potential was why I didn't go on um, some of the others. I, I, I don't need any help with that. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. 
So, so Scott, you were telling us some interesting history about quinine beforehand. Yeah, so I was reading a, um, a book recently, um, it's actually this book here called The Mosquito by Timothy Weingard. And one of the things that I didn't know that I was really fascinated by is how um, the, uh, the, basically the medication that was available prior to the current ones that we were just talking about. So before chloroquine and, and doxycycline and uh, mefloquine, um, basically it was quinine and quinine comes from the bark of a tree called the cinchona tree, which is native to South America. And that was the, basically the best source that existed in the world for preventing and treating malaria. And so um, it was actually used that control over that resource that, that uh, access to that tree that produced quinine was, was used um, for a military advantage during the U this US civil war. So, um, you know, imports from South America of quinine um, were controlled uh, by the union and the blockade of the South uh, by the union basically prevented access to that uh, anti-malaria medication for the Confederacy. So the Confederacy didn't have access to malaria medication during the Civil War and malaria was rampant in the South at that time. So, so that actually was something that conferred a military advantage to the Union during um, the Civil War. And then a similar thing happened during World War II in which the Japanese occupation of much of uh, Southeast Asia uh, meant that they had control over uh, the same medication because by that time, the trees that are native to South America that produce quinine had been exported to Southeast Asia and were growing in plantations. So when the Japanese um, began to occupy much of Southeast Asia, they gained control over the majority of the world's access to quinine and malaria was rampant in the Pacific theater during World War II and in North Africa. So I didn't know that history, but it's really fascinating to think how control over um, that medication was used for a, a military advantage. Yeah, control over plants from military advantage. Like that's that's crazy. And I, I remember when I was in grad school and I learned that malaria had been in the US at some point that like blew my mind. I sort of hadn't, that hadn't been a possibility in my head before I, I learned about it, but yeah. Right, because wild. Yeah, I mean, luckily we don't have to worry about malaria within the US much anymore, but it was a real big thing. Malaria and yellow fever were um, widespread up, even up north in like, you know, Philadelphia and Washington, DC. Those were places where they had a lot of mosquito borne disease. So Man, a lot of history so here. That book? Sorry, what? Sorry, so you recommend that book? Oh yeah, this is a really good book. I, I highly recommend it. It, it really um, is more of a history book than a, than a entomology book. It's called The Mosquito, but it's really uh, about how mosquitoes have affected human history. So I, I really do highly recommend that book. Awesome. So what are you drinking, Kelly? So I uh, got assigned the mocktail and it's called the Revitalizer. And just looking at it, so it's got carrot juice and apple juice and ginger syrup and lime. And looking at it makes me feel like I'm one of on one of those like juice cleanse diets, which I've never actually done. Uh, but it definitely has that vibe. Uh, and it also kind of has that taste where like you feel like, oh, I'm doing something good for myself, which I, you know, it's not really what I want to go for when I'm going for a drink. So uh, I don't know that I would recommend it, but it was an experience that made me smile. So that's, that's good. And I feel healthy-ish. So we have all sorts I'm sure of- I'm with sugar. Ah, okay. Yeah, that helps helps the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, what do you say we jump into our, our first presentation? That sounds great. So our first presentation of the day is uh, a talk called the tumor, the tumor Microenvironment, a Battle Between Normal and Abnormal. It's by Hannah Starobinitz. She's a scientist at Genosia Biosciences. And I told myself I was gonna remember how to ask Hannah how to say Genosia, but I forgot. So let's just pretend I totally got that it's right. Genosia. It's Genosia. Genosia, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and she was previously at the University of California, San Francisco and MIT. 
And her fun fact is that she has done lab work, driven cross, cross country, and summited mountains with her babies, uh, which blows my mind. I think during one of your, it, one was is the cross country trip that you were talking about when you stopped by my place in Houston? Yep, that's right. the one. Yeah. So you do epic things with your family and today we're gonna hear about your epic research. Cool, thanks. I'll figure out how to share this again. Awesome, okay, can you still hear me? Yes, cool. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Hannah Starobinets. Um, this is proof <laughs> of the lab work portion uh, with my first uh, daughter. And today I will be telling you about um, my, really my favorite um, subfield of cancer biology, which is the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and as Kelly said, it really is a battle, literally a battle between normal and abnormal. So um, just like a tiny bit of cancer 101, uh, to help orient, orient everyone, where does cancer even come from? Um, so cancers go through a cell cycle. Uh, first they rest, then they grow, and they kind of, you know, do whatever they're supposed to be doing in the body. Then when they're ready to divide, they copy their DNA uh, so that, you know, they have two copies to give to their two daughter cells. They reorganize a bit, and then they divide. And here's what that looks like. It's really pretty. Uh, you can see the cell is has copied its DNA, so it has two like little nuclei there. And here you can see they're pulling apart um, to create two daughter cells. Cool. So um, this process, you know, is what every cell in the body goes through, and it's really tightly regulated. Um, so there are growth drivers and growth blocks to make sure it all goes right, and you know, no mistakes happen. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, mistakes do happen. Um, and so when cells are copying their DNA, you know, that happens millions of times in your body, billions of times. And so eventually, like here and there, you're going to get a copy uh, mistake. Um, so that's called a mutation. Uh, and usually it's fine. No big deal. It's just in some random part of the genome. Don't worry about it. Uh, and but just in case the cells do have a proofreading mechanism to kind of go through and make sure they clear out those mistakes. So usually you're totally fine. Uh, but sometimes, whoops, uh, a mutation happens in a growth driver and it gets stuck in an on position. So that's not great because now you're just driving growth over and over and over. Uh, and well, this is kind of another oops where you broke a growth block just totally accidentally, but you mutated something and broke it. Um, and hopefully proofreading does take care of this because you don't want a cell to be stuck in the on position. You, don't know, you do not want it just cycling and growing and dividing forever. Uh, but unfortunately, a mutation could also break the proofreading mechanism. So if these things happen, unfortunately, a, a cell can become a cancer cell where it's now starting to grow and divide beyond any of these forms of control. It's now transformed into a cancer cell. Uh, these kinds of mutations are called driver mutations because they, they sort of start and drive the cancer. But then when it's cycling over and over and over, it just picks up more mutations and those are called passenger mutations. Uh, okay, so that's just basically what cancer is. Uh, and you're probably thinking, okay, cool. So got it, cancer cell just divides, divides, divides. Now I have a ball of cancer cells and that's bad. So how do I stop it? Right, and so some traditional cancer therapies you've probably heard of, chemotherapy and radiation, they block cell division, which I just told you about. And then there are more targeted therapies that are gonna um, try to block some of these mutated cell growth programs. So we're really focused on growth division. We do not want that to happen, we wanna stop it. Um, and so here is like an example of what um, patient survival might look like for a really aggressive cancer. So on this axis, we have survival and here we have time. So at the beginning, 100% of these patients are alive. And unfortunately, because it's an ex, you know, imagined example of an aggressive cancer, eventually all of these patients die, even though they were given cancer therapy, uh, chemotherapy specifically. But if you give them targeted therapy where you're really trying to target those specific mutations, you can actually buy these patients some time. But in this um, you know, hypothetical example, unfortunately, all of these patients end up dying because you bought them some time but their cancer became resistant. And so how did that happen? Maybe they mutated the target, so that drug like can't bind that um, 
messed up cell growth program anymore. Or maybe it's like, okay, fine. You want to target this growth signal over here? I'll just turn on another one. I don't care. And so now, you know, scientists are like, wait, okay, got it. So I targeted that one and then you made shaded that one. So I'm going to target that one too. It's okay. I got this. I got this combination therapy, right? So uh, this is what combination therapy ends up looking like. This is, you know, real. <laughs> um, so, you know, got that one, you got that one. Okay. You have to just get them all. And the cancer just keeps mutating and keeps figuring out how to get around your clever, clever therapy. Right. So, you know, not the best traditional cancer therapies. They, um, they sometimes work, but they do often fail um, for this reason. So what is a tumor? It's not actually a ball of cancer cells. So when I think of a tumor, I think of a planetarium and they show you the earth. And then, and then they do this like for me, really depressing thing where they zoom out and they're like, you're totally insignificant. But um, the larger context of the solar system actually informs you know, how the earth behaves, right? So it you know, moves in a certain way that's informed by the things around it. And so if you take a cancer cell and you zoom it out and you put it in the greater context of its environment, the things in that environment also inform how the cancer cell behaves and how the you know, tumor behaves and how the patient's disease progresses. So this is a tumor um, and it's really pretty. Uh, so this teal ball over here is your ball of cancer cells and another ball and another ball and another ball, all these little nests. But you can see there's like a lot of other stuff happening here. All these different colored cells are like all over the place and like what is going on here? There's like a ribbon of stuff flowing through this like river. And I don't know, there's like red stuff over here, red and yellow and green stuff up there in the top left. So there's clearly like a lot of action happening here. And it's not just that little ball of cancer cells. There's like all this other stuff here. Um, and so over the next few minutes, I just wanna like share my excitement with you about all these other things that are not cancer cells. So what cells are in there? Um, here are fibroblasts. I'll tell you later a little bit more about them, but it doesn't matter. Uh, just looking at these two pictures of human tumors, you can see that on the left, you have a lot of fibroblasts. On the right, you have like a lot, a lot of fibroblasts. Like this tumor is like 10% tumor and like 90% fibroblasts. So that's, you know, though they're probably having some kind of effect there, right? And then these are blood vessels. So tumors are full of blood vessels, but you can also see between different tumors, you have different amounts. Um, and so this one, you know, that's just like full of blood vessels. Maybe they're, you know, more important to that tumor. I don't know. Uh, in these pictures, I'm showing you immune cells. Um, these are kind of my current favorite, a little biased. Um, but over here on the left, you can see T cells. You may have heard about them a little bit um, because of the pandemic. But you can see that um, they're not even that like evenly spread. You have an area of the tumor that doesn't have any, an area that's full of them. And then here, they're kind of evenly spread. On the right, we have another type of immune cell. These are myeloid cells, just basically kind of going through and showing you all these different cells that you could have in a tumor that are not even cancer cells at all. Uh, and what I want to stress here is that these normal cells are not innocent bystanders. So they're not just hanging out there. They're doing something. So here is, again, survival um, of real human cancer patients. These ones have kidney cancer. And you can see that in the blue, you have a population of cancer patients that have pretty good prognosis. Like if you look on the axis, it's like 75% of them are just going to survive. And in the purple, you have um, patients with bad prognosis. So they um, die more than the other ones. And the difference between these two lines is how many blood vessels they had. So you can see the blue was low amounts of blood vessels and the purple was high amounts of blood vessels. So in this particular type of tumor, um, the blood vessels are acting as an accomplice. So the more blood vessels you had, the worse the patients were. Here's another accomplice, very similar graph, also kidney cancer, but now looking at fibroblasts, lots of fibroblasts, bad prognosis. But here we have a nemesis. So these are T cells. Um, they actually fight cancer, which I'll tell you more about later. And you can see that when you have high amounts of T cells, you have to have really good prognosis, like 80% survival. And when you have low amounts of T cells, you have really terrible prognosis. So depending on the cancer type and depending on the cell type, they can have um, a good or bad effect, but they're not just hanging out there. They're really having, they're, they're having a function in the tumor and then an effect on the patient's uh, survival. And so, okay, 
let's think about the tumor as like a whole organ, right? It has cancer cells, but it has all these other cells. And um, one professor, his name is Hal Dvorak. He came up with the uh, really popular phrase, which is tumors are wounds that never heal. So what do I mean by that? Here is a wound. Uh, imagine this is like your skin and cut yourself with a kitchen knife and oops, you have like missing skin there and uh, kind of blood mess. Um, and the skin cells are gonna send out signals. They're gonna cry out, help me, I'm broken, what do I do? Um, and they recruit all of these other cells to come fix that gap. So what doesn't matter what these cells are exactly, but basically there's a cleanup crew, some immune cells that come in, have to like clean up the damage. There's probably bacteria in there. Uh, they do need to send for reinforcements because they need more and more cells to come clean that up. And then, um, oh, these are fibroblasts, which I mentioned before. Um, they and other cells are gonna send out growth factors. So you've heard about growth already, um, and now you're hearing growth again. So that should kind of click for you a little bit. But these cells are sending out growth signals to help these cells grow and, and move and physically fill in that gap. Okay, and then the skin is fixed and it's done and all this all this like stuff down here is gonna go away and the wound will resolve. But tumors have figured out like, oh, hang on, I can yell for help too. And I'm gonna recruit all these other cells and they're gonna send out growth signals. And I love growth signals because I'm a cancer cell and I just wanna grow uncontrollably. So now not only do they have their own growth um, like dysregulated, they're also getting like bathed in growth signals from fibroblasts and these immune cells. And they're, and they're gonna keep pretending to be a wound and they're never gonna heal. Cause why would they heal? Cause they just wanna keep getting growth signals forever. So this is kind of one reason that the tumor is filled with all these cells because they've recruited them, hijacked them and forced them to like support the tumor's own growth. Uh, switching over to blood vessels. Um, blood vessels and tumors are really interesting. So tumors need blood because they need nutrients and oxygen just like any other um, cell in your body. And so they need to force blood vessels to grow because if the, if the cancer ball just grows indefinitely, it's gonna to be too far away from oxygen. It'll just suffocate. So it needs to get blood vessels to sort of come along for the ride. And so here's what a normal blood vessel is supposed to look like. It's just kind of like a nice sandwich of a couple of cell types and some collagen there. It's all like nicely arranged. It's kind of like a straw. So you can see here that the red cells are wrapped around the green. And then in a tumor though, like my five-year-old daughter looked at this and was like, oh no, that doesn't look the same at all, right? So you can see that the layers are just pulling off from each other and stripping and these red cells are stripping off of the green tubes. And the reason that happens is just like the wound that never heals, this tumor is growing so fast and it's telling the blood vessels to just grow, grow, grow. Um, they never really have a chance to form properly. And if they don't form properly by structure, they certainly can't function right. So this is what happens when you have uh, you know, a leaky hose, you have messed up, uh, you know, areas where you just have popping out water. In this case, it's going to be blood. Um, and so you're going to have like a lake over here. And then, you know, maybe over here, you won't have any blood at all because it all leaked out somewhere else. So it's not going to be, you know, the structure's not right, but then also the function isn't right. And so here's what a normal mouse colon looks like. If you light up the blood vessels, Here's what a mouse colon tumor looks like. And those blood vessels are just not normal. They've grown out of control. The tumor just forced them to grow any which way. So they're not like regulated. And this is a problem. It, um, it's a problem for drug delivery too. Cause when we, you know, we, we send drugs down this hose we kind of expect it to go all the way through but if it's leaking out all over the tumor um, it might not reach all parts of the tumor. So blood vessels are really important to study as well and try to, you know try to get them to be more normal is one approach people take. Uh, so finally, my favorite uh, cell in the microenvironment are immune cells because they can actually detect and destroy cancer. So here we have T cells. Again, you've probably heard a little bit about them. Um, so killer T cells, great name, right? Um, they can actually detect cancer cells because they can see pieces of the cancer cell presented on the surface. That's something that all cells in the body do. They're supposed to just kind of grab bits and pieces from their inside and just stick them up on the outside and the, and the T cells act as sort of policemen to make sure it's all normal. But cancer cells have mutations. 
And so if this is a little mutated piece of protein, killer T cell is going to realize that's not normal and it's going to kill the cancer cell. Helper T cells also detect pieces of the cancer cells, but they see it when it's eaten by this professional eater immune cell. So this dendritic cell might've eaten like maybe a piece of a cancer cell, grabbed its parts and shown it to the helper T cell. And this is the way that the immune system actually has evolved to see your cancer and kill it. So if all that proofreading stuff I mentioned up front didn't work, your T cells should come in and just clean it all out and you'll never even know you had a cancer cell running rogue. Uh, and so I'm going to show you a video. Uh, these are these blue cells are those professional uh, eater immune cells, and they actually found a, a green cancer cell over here. And when it found it, you could, do you see those little green dots inside the blue cell? That's because it actually like ate off a chunk of it and grabbed a chunk, and now it can go show it to those policemen T cells. Um, so yeah, these these blue cells are are doing a really good job of like policing the area and they're going to show like their supervisors what they found. And another video over here is of dendritic cells. So another professional um, immune cell, they are red and they grabbed little yellow bits of tumor. And once they grabbed them, they hopped over to a lymph node where the T cells live. And they're like, hey, hey, T cells, look what I found. So you can see that the red cells are showing the green cells, the little yellow parcels that they brought from a tumor. And now the T cells know what's going on. So they're going to go over and like, you know, tell the cancer to go away. Uh, but, you know, cancer cells do not want to die. So they are now fighting back. And so what they figured out is they can send out signals to put molecular breaks on these T cells so that they are not killed. But scientists are even cleverer than cancer cells. And uh, like a decade ago, scientists figured out that there are certain types of immunotherapies that can take these breaks off. And once we take those breaks off, we really unleash like the wrath of the immune system and they can come in and really clear out a lot of these cancer cells. And more recently, and this is what I actually study, um, we can create cancer vaccines that train these T cells to see the cancer. And that kind of provides the T cell with like a steering wheel where they can now detect a specific target rather than just taking the brakes off. You do, you do these things in combination. Now you have like crazy T cells with no brakes and like, you know, driving <laughs> the steering wheel uh, toward these cancer cells and hopefully, you know, destroying them. And so the question is, will immunotherapies cure cancer? And so going back to that survival graph I showed you before, um, the general immunotherapy that just takes the brakes off actually raises the curve up here. This, uh, first of all, is stunning um, after, you know, you know, half a century of, of doing this stuff over here to see this plateau. That's what a real, what a, what a real cure looks like. And so um, just an immunotherapy on its own, it depends on the cancer type, won't necessarily work in all of them, but in certain ones, it can really produce like 20 to 30% um, survival for a really aggressive cancer that used to be a death sentence. Now it, those people serve up, have been surviving for 10 years. Um, and so this is what a cure looks like, but can we bump that up by combining immunotherapies with other, um, other drugs out there with vaccines? Can we get this to get as close as we can to 100%? And that's really the goal. So great cancer immunotherapies and vaccines will really target the tumor specifically and unleash that the power um, that the immune system has evolved. And uh, so what I work on, which I won't get into here right now, but um, I work on personalized immunotherapies, personalized vaccines, where you can, you really have to consider the uniqueness of each person's tumor and their unique immune system, but then you can produce a personalized therapy for their immune system to attack their cancer. Uh, and just to wrap up, um, on the left are the therapies that target the cancer cell. Of course, they're still around, they're still gonna be used. But on the right, we have all these other options where we're considering the greater tumor microenvironment. We can uh, use drugs that target blood vessels, that target T cells, target uh, inflammatory cells, and, and a lot more. And by combining all these together, you can really um, you know, hit the tumor and, and destroy it. And with that, I will thank you for listening and uh, I look forward to your questions. So that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and you and I have talked about some of this stuff before. Uh, so I knew it was gonna be fascinating. Uh, and so the, the photos that you showed remind me a little, reminded me a little bit of our very first dorks where we had Sean 
Lapatino. Is that, am I saying her name right, Scott? It, and she, uh, she was, you know, showing these complicated photos of cells interacting and saying that it's sort of like its own language. And so you are clearly also reading the language of the cells, uh, which is exciting. And a picture is uh, worth, so you know, 10,000 words. Apparently, to me, they all, I think I, I said during Sean's talk that like, I don't speak any of these languages. And every time I've looked at a pathology slide, I've been like, no, nope, I don't know what's happening, but, uh, but you speak cells, so that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, so you talked about taking the breaks off of helper T cells. Is there any downside to taking the breaks off? Like, does anything, you know, they've got breaks for a reason. So does anything yep. bad happen when you take them off? Yeah, they, uh, side effects happen and sometimes they're really severe, um, which is why we didn't stop with immunotherapies and we're kind of going into like more targeted um, like vaccines and cell therapies. But yeah, what happens is, um, let's say you have a melanoma and you unleash, you unleash the whole immune system. Well, first of all, you can unleash any autoimmunity you accidentally had somewhere. So if you have like an autoimmune T cell somewhere in your body, um, your body's supposed to like shut that off with these breaks. But now the cancer is using breaks over here. You're like, let's take the breaks off everywhere. And then you end up having autoimmunity somewhere. So one thing that can happen is it could be just like totally random because of luck of the draw, or it could be something related to your tumor. So like, I think some people with melanoma who have this, these breaks taken off, they end up like losing pigment somewhere else in their body because the melanoma cells are melanocytes. They produce melanin. And now you're like other cells elsewhere, like gonna just attack anything with melanin, but that's not deadly, but other autoimmune conditions could, um, could get unleashed. And so that's what they have to pay attention to as a side effect. And yeah, but they pay attention to it very closely. Is, is autoimmune stuff more easily easy to control than cancer? Or I guess it depends on what autoimmune thing problem you end up with. I think it depends. And I think it just gets messy. So um, I think you hope that by taking the brakes off, you can kill the cancer before the autoimmunity kills you. Like if, if it's bad, or you might not have any autoimmunity, I think it depends. But if the side effects are really severe, you hope that you can clear out the cancer and then take the drug, take the drug off. Um, if it doesn't work, then yeah, you might have to just go off it. Um, but I think it's, it's a little bit of a sledgehammer approach, but the thing that it's taught us is that we can cure cancer, but now if we can tailor it and make it like less aggressive, um, and indiscriminate, uh, then we can still do it, but in a, sort of in a more intelligent way, maybe. Cool. That was such a great talk, Hannah. And, you know, I really it, it appreciated the kind of cartoon diagrams that you had, which it looked like you, you made those yourself. Is that right? Yeah, uh, I drew some of them for my thesis defense. Um, and then I've just kind of been drawing ever since because I realized it was better than trying to dig around the internet for pictures that explained exactly what I wanted to do. So I just draw them myself. No, it's great. I mean, I, you know, I, I try to find slides like that in my teaching when I'm like teaching the immune system or something. And I thought yours were, were excellent. So Thanks. Um, so, okay. So I, um, have a question for you. I've heard that there are some animals that don't get cancer. Like I've heard that for alligators, do you know if that's true? And, and if so, like why? Yeah. I haven't heard of alligators. I've heard of elephants. Um, so the proofreading part that I had, um, the proofreading gene we have is a little bit different than the elephant's version and the elephant's version apparently is way better. And so they proofread so well, they don't get tumors. So, but I don't know about alligators. So yeah, I'll have to no, look I mean, into it's, that. it's, it's interesting to think that there are any animals that wouldn't get cancer because it just seems to be kind of baked into being a, a like a multicellular organism right and so are, is that something that i'm sure people are looking at you know is there something that we can learn that we can use for ourselves based on elephants or alligators or any other species that um that, that, yeah. that seem to do it better than us well i mean i think we definitely can learn from other animals so you know like with the pandemic we're learning that bats have crazy good immune systems and what can we learn from that and so for for cancer i mean if it's a different version of a gene I don't know if we can like change our gene per se, but um, that said, if it's something that we can create a drug for, um, I don't know in this particular example with the elephant, if that would lead to it, but if we can see that, oh, they have a different version of something and therefore it does this, this and that, if we can come up with a, with a druggable approach. Yeah, but I mean, unless you're gonna do like 
designer babies. I don't think we can like put the elephant gene in, into ourselves. Yeah, I feel like that could come with some unintended consequences. Uh, probably <laughs> want to be careful about making people into um, anything too closely resembling an elephant. Um, <laughs> Amber, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I did. I've, I've loved this presentation. I learned so much. Um, but I was thinking on the application side of it. So if you are somebody who is navigating a cancer diagnosis, or if you're a caregiver or family member who's helping to navigate that, how could you use this information to help with some sort of like patient advocacy or being a little bit more um, innovative with different opportunities for care? Sure. Um... Yeah, it's, it's complicated for sure. Um, and like, I'm a scientist, so I don't ever see patients in person. But um, when I have had people ask me like on a personal level, like I I've always said, well, immunotherapies, like if you have access to try an immunotherapy, um, try it because like they can't, depending on the cancer and depending on if you can tolerate the side effects, like they do cure people. Um, and so, you know, 15, 20 years ago, a person with melanoma, that's a death sentence. And now these immunotherapies are really just curing them completely. Uh, not all of them, but you know, some percent of them. So I've always just been like, immunotherapies, go for it if you can, if your doctor like has access to them. Uh, so you, when you were showing one of your graphs, you mentioned uh, that immunotherapies don't work on all cancers. Can yeah. we, is there any like framework for figuring out which ones they work on and which ones they don't? Yeah. Um, and I will say that the goal is to get them to work on all of them, but that's like hardcore, like <laughs> cutting edge, like how do we get this to work? But in general, like if, you, if I were just to tell you like right now, how we do we figure it out? Basically, the more differences your cancer has, the more chances your immune system has to see something that's different. So if your cancer has one mutation, you don't have a lot of opportunity. If your cancer has a thousand mutations, you have a thousand chances. And so actually you can stratify, you can like draw a graph where you're like, number of number of mutations for this type of like average number of mutations for colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, boop, boop, boop. And actually melanoma and lung cancer are at the top because they're caused by environmental factors um, as opposed to like a hereditary, like single gene that drove your cancer with a melanoma or lung cancer. That's like a, yeah, like either pollution or like smoking. There are so many mutations there, like thousands, literally thousands of mutations that your immune system just can see more things. And if you, the immune system can see more things, when you unleash it, you you're unleashing more stuff. Whereas if you had like a hereditary cancer that was driven by one gene, you unleash the immune system, but the immune system is like, what? I don't see anything. <laughs> so, um, but that said, you know, scientists do want uh, immunotherapies to work on all the cancers. So I think they're trying to figure out how to make those cold tumors that aren't seen as well um, hotter. I'm kind of fascinated by the idea that in, in a sense, cancer is, is, is our own bodies attacking ourselves, right? I mean, it's our cell. You said sometimes it can have an environmental, there can be an environmental factor that triggers it, but at the end of the day, it's the, you know, the cancerous cells were our own cells prior to the yep. mutations. So one thing I'm wondering, I'm, you know, I'm an evolutionary biologist, that's, that's my background. So I tend to think about everything in the lens of evolution. So given mm -hmm. that cancer is our own cells that are mutating and attacking us, can cancers evolve or can hosts evolve to be more resistant to cancers or is that impossible because it's all essentially the same organism? Yeah, so I think about evolution a lot because I think about cancer a lot. Um, it, you know, cancer is evolving. It, it, it starts with one cell that's normal, then one cell with one mutation that's just a little bit off of normal. And then it evolves with the same forces of natural selection to, to get it like to these, sim to these similarities, like, oh, I'm gonna evade the immune system. Oh, hang on, I need to grow blood vessels. And it is evolving. Uh, by natural selection to figure out that it needs to do those things. So once you see a tumor, you are, you're seeing evolution. And in fact, when one cell divides, 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 some of its daughters over here accumulate different mutations than the ones over here. So there's actually like clonal evolution effects within a tumor where it's not all the same. And I guess your question is, can it evolve further? I think it just keeps evolving until it kills the person. Uh, so it is evolving all the time. And it's kind of like a new form of life at that point that's just figuring out like the rules and constraints of its system, but either, either we kill it or it kills a patient, but 
for now it just kind of is like a parasite <laughs> yeah exactly so right so what you're saying i think is is cancer absolutely is evolution in the sense that like the lineage of cells that became cancerous are undergoing their own evolutionary process within our bodies um yeah which is which is really fascinating um yeah i guess what i was wondering is like could a species like our like homo sapiens could we as a species evolve to be more cancer resistant or are we becoming more susceptible to cancer like is mm -hmm. that even possible given that it's just all one kind of one species and, and then occasionally these cells go rogue or or, or whatever or am i am i thinking yeah. about that the wrong um, way well the problem is that um on a human level like if you already had babies and then you got your cancer evolution doesn't really care uh so so for the most part these mistakes they happen on such a large time scale that you end up getting cancer after you already had kids and then evolution can't take care of it anymore. So I guess you'd need, you would need an evolutionary pressure uh, in order to not, in order to be cancer resistant, but we generally get, tend to get cancer when we're a lot older. Right, so in other words, like uh, natural selection can't touch the things that don't influence the number of babies that you have, right? So if you exactly. already had your kids, and you do or don't have cancer doesn't make any difference to how many copies of your genes move on to the next yeah. generation. Yeah. Yeah. So if like a family, if a family that had no cancer had more babies and a family that had cancer had fewer babies for some reason, then then on an evolutionary scale, you could see difference, but otherwise it's just random. The only cancers that affect people early in life should be able to evolve that way. That's yeah, yeah. that makes sense. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Athena at Kippis wrote an interesting book on the evolution and ecology of tumor cells. Uh, so, and makes some of the points you two were just making during this conversation. But if anybody, there's a whole book on that topic, actually, if anybody wants to read it. Cool. Uh, so I think we should move to Amber. And then if anyone has additional questions for Hannah, they can put it in the Q&A box and we can come back together as a group uh, at the very end. Uh, so folks can still ask their questions if they have them. Way to go, Hannah. Awesome. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, Hannah. I really enjoyed that, that talk. So our next presenter is Amber Barnes. And uh, the title of uh, her talk is Using One Health to Examine Zoonotic Enteric Parasites in Mongolia. Uh, so Amber is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, her fun fact is that she got really into soap making during the pandemic. And now everyone in her life is getting soap for the holidays, which, you know, I feel like some people like learned how to make sourdough bread or something during the pandemic. You have a very practical hobby that you picked up for uh, very appropriate for a pandemic. So, so well done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I was uh, worried about those uh, supplies, so <laughs> I tried to go the opposite direction. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about One Health and how I have applied it recently to some research I did with some partners in Mongolia. And so... Excuse me. So I think I'll talk a little bit about kind of what One Health is in case it's not familiar to any of you. Um, and then I'll talk about the research and some of the main findings. And then I would love to sit and just chat with anybody with any questions or um, advice or any thoughts anybody has on this or similar things. Or we can go back to Hannah's research too. Excuse me. So one Health is not a new concept, but it's kind of buzzy. It's a little trendy, but it's something that I really believe in with my research. And it's this notion of you can't tackle one element of health, whether that be human, animal, or environmental, without looking at how they're all interconnected. So it's a very intuitive approach. It's kind of a framework to your research. It, um, it just craves and, and necessitates um, collaboration with other disciplines and other fields and other stakeholders. And it's this notion of kind of simultaneously looking at these impacts together. So 
um, there's this idea and this concept of wicked problems. And those are some of these issues that can't be solved with just a yes or a no, because there's a ripple effect to all of them. So if you changed a policy regarding one thing, how does it affect this group or this group? Or what can we expect years down the road? So there's a lot of social and um, economic and cultural components. And this is something I think we're all a little bit more familiar with as we've started to think about our impact on the groups around us and the environments around us. One Health is really beautiful in the fact that if you're looking at a research topic or question and you're thinking about it kind of with this One Health lens, you're going to reach across the aisle to other areas and disciplines to look for collaboration. And so you can do this in a multitude of ways. Personally, my research and my experience and my passions are in those top three bullets on the left of animal health, human health, and environmental health, and really looking at infectious diseases, particularly with some parasites. Um, but you can think about it in terms of everything on this list and more. And even if we want to pull in from Hannah's presentation and thinking about cancer and how we might utilize cancer in, in the animal population and how can we use veterinary medicine with human medicine and, and where's the connection, how can we help both? Or even if you wanna look at gender disparities and violence, we know that a lot of victims of domestic violence or unsafe homes don't feel that they can leave that environment if they have a pet, um, if they're not allowed to take that pet into a, a shelter or into a next safe space. So having our relationships with our companion animals can be a barrier to that next step. However, in a One Health kind of notion for this, we could look at ways of making um, domestic violence shelters or family shelters pet friendly or having options so that we can actually think about the safety of our furry ones as well. So One Health is just this idea of if you take a step back out of exactly what you're looking at and your primary focus and think about how this collective question might be influencing other groups and then inviting some of those experts or people from those areas in on the research to kind of work alongside of you to address this wicked problem. The reason that Mongolia was the site for my some of my most recent research is because it's such a unique and beautiful country and there's some really cool um, research angles that that are inherent to the country. For one, it's a very beautiful, vast, large country. The land mass alone, it's a, it's a big country, but the human population is actually very small. There's only about 3 million people, a little over 3 million people across the entire country. Over half of them live in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. So you've got this big country, this big land mass, land mass, a small human population, but the livestock population is about 66 million. So 3 million people, 66 million livestock. You can see where the human animal interactions there are, are pretty unique and they're going to be um, pretty close. The contact will be pretty close. The other thing, if you want to think about the One Health triad of human, animal, and environment, is the fact that Mongolia has really extreme temperatures. You can be 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the summertime and below 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the wintertime. And those temperature fluxes can have an, an enormous influence on the health and well-being of humans and animals in that, in that environment. Mongolian households can also be pretty unique and the fact that there is a really strong pride and cultural heritage with nomadic herdsmen. And so the, the collapsible and movable gear system of their homes, which are, we call them yurts a lot of times in the United States, but they're movable so they can seasonally change where the household location is based on the needs of the livestock and what's going on weather-wise. So in our rural communities in Mongolia, we see a lot of these gear households. And this picture right here, you can see that they're pretty isolated. They're by themselves. They're not plugged into any of the city system at all. In peri-urban communities, so right around the edges of our city centers, um, and we really are, are looking at Ulaanbaatar, that major capital city, as, as the biggest city um, for the, the country, 
there's a lot of kind of sprawling communities and there's slum communities according to the United Nations and things like that in which we've got a lot of rural to urban migration but they're not getting set up into the infrastructure of the city so they don't have heating, they're not plugged into piped water that is much safer to use, or um, flush toilets or any type of sanitation that is a safe removal of waste from the environment. So they're there in the city, but they're on the outskirts and they don't get all of the benefit of the city structure. And then you have your urban dwellers who are part of the infrastructure of the city. So they, they usually have the central heating, they've got piped water, and they've got some type of a sanitation that removes the waste from their living environment. I look at zoonotic diseases. So these are the types of infections and illnesses that can be shared between humans and animals. Zoonotic diseases are typically from animal to human. However, we can also transmit diseases back to animals, which is often called reverse zoonoses. And we've seen a lot of that in the news with our captive animals in zoos and sanctuaries that we've given coronavirus to. So if we think about some of our big cats in a lot of these zoo situations that have come down with coronavirus, it's probably from either the keepers or the guests coming in with coronavirus and actually transmitting it to the animals. We can get diseases that are shared from animals from bites and scratches or contact with all kinds of contaminated items. But the one that I focus on is the exposure pathway of fecal oral transmission. So that's that accidental poop ingestion. And that's how we can get um, exposure to Cryptosporidium and Giardia, which are the parasites that I like to look at. When we're thinking about ways in which animal waste or human waste might be an exposure pathway for particularly these two parasites, Mongolia has some really cool and unique ways in which that might happen. One is that if we think about those rural households and those herding households, so those individuals who have a lot of um, contact with animals, we also have some seasonal variation with the types of um, contact. We have cashmere season where we might be um, collecting some of the cashmere fibers for sale or horse racing seasons or camel racing seasons. So you're moving animals, you're, you might be kind of stressing them in a race situation. Um, and then you also have the food products and the animal products that you use. So culturally, meat and milk are very important in Mongolia. They're a staple in our, um, on the tables in Mongolia. So most houses, whether rural or urban, are going to have some kind of a meat or milk dish. And so the way those meat and milk products are prepared, the way that the, the items from the animals are gathered, all of that can have an impact on the way that, that we might have some sort of a um, transmission from um, through these different parasites. So what I was doing most recently in Mongolia was working with my two Mongolian research collaborators. And so what we were looking at was, okay, we have this unique environment. We have some transmission risks that are pretty unique to Mongolia. How does this all work together to potentially put some of these parasites in our living environment? And where are they in our living environment? Are they in the animals? Are they in people? Do we have them in the household drinking water? Could they be spread through flies? What are some of the ways in which we're seeing these parasites in the Mongolian households? And then while we were doing that, while we wanted to get this data, we also wanted to know what was going on with some of the risk factors at the household level. And this from a public health standpoint would then help lead to some ideas for culturally appropriate and culturally relevant um, interventions and control measures. We tried to do as best we could with sampling throughout the country, but it's a, it's a vast country and the road network is not always great everywhere. Um, the beauty of Mongolia is some of its rustic nature. And so we kind of had to think about where we could go that we could also get back with our samples in time. So seasonally, we tried to do some different time frames for temperature comparisons and stuff like that. So we had three rural provinces, which were Salang, Zabkhan, and Dungobi. And we get 25 houses in the spring and 25 houses in the summer, um, late spring and kind of early fall. 
And then we had in Tov province where the capital city is located, this is where we did our peri-urban and our urban sampling. So we tried to do rural versus urban, um, some late spring, late summer comparison. Um, so we try to do all of this with our, our work. When we did our sampling, we wanted, again, to look for the parasites and see, are they in the animals? Are they in people? What about our water? And what about some flies? Because we know that flies can land on waste from um, people or from animals that haven't been properly managed, and then they can land on our food, um, and then that can be a source of contamination. So we got that, and then with our household survey, we worked with our household members to find out, where did you get your drinking water? How are you uh, managing your, your own personal waste at your household? What kind of contact do you have with animals? Um, then we asked some food safety questions. We also asked some things related to their, their risk perception. So do you know that, that animals can give you disease? Do you know that you can give animals disease? And then we asked a few questions related to that. We used uh, a lab analysis to look for whether or not the the two parasites we were looking for, crypto and giardia, whether or not they were in any of the samples we collected. And they were, we did find them. We found them in about uh, 51 households. So of our 250 overall samples, we had 20% of the households that had at least one of the parasites in at least one of our sample types. So here you can kind of see we had most of our positive households had a human sample. Um, sometimes we found it in just animals. Sometimes we found a household that had flies, some with water. And then a few households had two samples that were positive. So they had humans and animals who both had parasites at the same site. And then another couple that had um, fly and water. Majority of our households that we did find parasites were in the rural provinces. And we expected this because of, again, this is where we're gonna find a lot of that human animal contact. But some other things that we found that really highlighted some of the inequities we see with the water sanitation and hygiene of our rural households. So they're kind of out on their own and they're isolated and they're off grid and they are, possibly more exposed to some of these issues concerning some of the parasite presence. So we saw that most of our households in the rural area, they're, well, almost half of them are not using water that we would consider from an improved source. So that's just water sources that are inherently more risky for some sort of a pathogen or microorganism that could make somebody sick. Um, we have a lot more people in our peri-urban area, so even though they're not maybe plugged in all the way, they are still able to access more accessible, more um, safe drinking water sources. And then we also learned, even though we know that the households that we sampled from the urban areas, they were improved, and we know 90-something percent of them were actually using private um, piped water, for some reason, they all said that they were something else. So um, we need to kind of look at that culturally and see why did their urban households say that they weren't because we knew that they were. So something to kind of look at in the future. Um, in our rural households that aren't using improved drinking water sources, most of them are getting their water from what we consider surface water. So they're collecting it from nearby lakes or nearby rivers and streams. We also found that we have a lot of our households that had parasites were also using unimproved water. So something's going on there. When we looked at sanitation, so what kind of facilities or services do, does your household use to try to manage your own personal human excrement? We found that a lot of the rural households, again, are not using anything that we would consider a safe management of waste. So our rural households, they, they don't have access to improved water sources. They're not utilizing or have access to improved sanitation services. And that's putting them at risk for having contaminated waste in their environment. So we saw, again, we're having more unimproved sanitation that's connected to the parasite presence as well. The third aspect of WASH, which stands for water sanitation and hygiene, is this idea of 
okay, so the drinking water, do we have safe, improved drinking water sources? Do we have safe or improved sanitation services? And do we have a place where we can wash our hands? So is there soap and, and water available? Where is that site located? And again, we are finding that we have discrepancies with our rural and urban areas in terms of the ability to wash your hands. When we put all this together, the main thing I just want to point out from this is through our analysis using um, bivariate and multivariate regression, it was the water that we found most significant for parasite presence at the home. When households had improved water sources that they were using for their drinking water, there was less parasite presence at that home or that household, whereas the households that were using unapproved drinking water sources, they had a much greater chance of having one of these parasites at their home. Some other things we found um, was that it seems to be that, that having a hand washing site and having it indoors is also very protective. And then we noticed that, again, having animals at the home is going to increase your risk for parasite presence. One other thing that came out of the, the research, one of the other things I wanted to highlight is this notion of the risk does not just stop at whether or not you had access to good sanitation and good drinking water and all of that. We also found that some of the risk factors might depend on what your role is in the home. So what, what is your gender and what does that gender role mean for your household involvement with animal contact? So we found that we saw a lot of really wonderful kind of um, co-chores that were done between males and females when we asked, you know, who's primarily responsible for some of these actions. So herding of the animals, that's done by both men and women. Both men and women are feeding the animals. Both men and women are treating sick animals and helping with animal births. So a lot of shared responsibility and shared risk with some of the contact for those, those different actions. But there was some unique um, splitting of gender roles related to um, more women were responsible for milking of the livestock or cooking the meat and the milk. So they have unique risk factors there. For our men, we see that they are primarily responsible for slaughtering and butchering the livestock. So if we want to think about ways in which we can make human animal contact safer in these households, we may want to target some of our messages related to the gender roles specific to that risk. So the summary of the main findings is, yep, we found the parasites we were looking for and we found them kind of across our different sample types. We did find more in the rural areas, which we would have anticipated because of more animal contact due to the herding nature of those households. We also found that a lot of the animals weren't just positive, humans or animals, weren't positive for just one parasite, but they were positive for both. So that telling us that some of the places that had parasite presence might be having quite a bit of um, transmission happening or the exposure pathways are, are really um, something to consider for both parasites. Um, but we really found that it's, it, a lot of our public health messaging and our future research needs to be done on how we can improve water sanitation and hygiene at these different levels of households, but how do we do that culturally um, in a way that will work? So you're not gonna be able to ask somebody who's a nomadic herdsman to just you know, plug into a city grid for the whole year because they need to take their animals and move them. So how do we make sure that the drinking water that they're using and they have access to is safe without infringing upon this nomadic tradition? So that's gonna be really um, a, something to look for in the future. And all of this is kind of gearing us towards this one health and this need to really have more um, collaboration between our public health providers and our public health professionals and our surveillance teams and our epidemiologists in Mongolia as well as our veterinary health professionals. So more collaboration and more um, discussion and more disease surveillance between the two groups. And then really thinking about, okay, now that we know this, how do we take this and move it forward in a way that we can promote safer interactions between our humans and our animals within these different groups? All right, and I think that's it. I just wanted to thank everybody that was a part of the, um, the study.
All right. Thank you. That was really interesting. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I love the, the One Health perspective, this idea. I mean, it's so intuitive on one hand, it, you know, of course, all these things are interconnected. And yet for so much of our history, we've thought of these as separate issues. Uh, it just it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So um, so I, I have a question to get us started here. So you mentioned uh, one of your results, you found that about 20% of the households had parasites in at least one of the samples, whether it was in the, um, you know, the human samples or the livestock or elsewhere. How does that compare with other regions of the world where people rear livestock? Is that like especially high? Is that typical? I'm just, I don't, I don't have any kind of benchmark for like, you know, um, for, for, for ranchers or people who are raising livestock and what kind of parasite levels are, are, are common. We, we do, it is, it's pretty normal, but in the rural community, we did see some higher aspects related to certain animal species. So we actually had a higher rate of parasites in horses in our group than we saw in uh, a very similar study done in, in horses in China, for example. So um, part of the unique nature of this was looking at all of them at the same time. So our rate was actually higher in some of our, um, in the animals than some of the previous crypto work in the, in the region, but that work was done with some pretty unique um, herds that, that are, were more contained and didn't have as close contact with animals. So it's kind of a, a new baseline almost because of looking at the, these animals are not slaughter animals, which are a really easy group to kind of look at for sampling or, um, or there is some work that's been done on um, herds that, that don't come in at night to their, and, and stay around the gears. So that's one thing about here is that Every day, the herder will take the, the animals out to pasture, and then they bring them back. And so they're not necessarily um, fenced in, but they are usually all kept near the gear. So that, that home is such a hub for the entire ecosystem of the livestock and the people there. So um, it's not too far off from what we've seen before, but there are some elements that are a little higher, a little lower here based on these kind of unique aspects of the sampling. Great, thank you. So I, oh, sorry. Okay. So I thought your talk was really interesting. And so I do some parasite stuff, but I've never done it in like a One Health framework. And so one thing that I've always wondered is, so, you know, One Health is really interesting because it's interdisciplinary, but it's also intercultural. <laughs> and I think that like that, moving across cultures is, you know, opens up a lot of opportunities, but it also sounds like it could be really hard. And, you know, like, so when you said that some folks weren't being honest about where their water was coming from, I was wondering, like, you know, even in the US, you get a bunch of people who don't trust their scientists. If you get a scientist from another country, then maybe you're even more skeptical, but you were working with locals. And so what, what in general is your thought on how how ready the world is for a One Health approach with scientists from all over the world coming together to solve problems? And is it easier in, you know, in some cases or other cases? Yes, I, this is kind of, it's very intuitive to me to, to use One Health on paper. In practice, it can be really, really hard. And I have done this approach in Kenya as well. And the, the only way that I have had success, and there's always hiccups and there's always missteps, um, is just to remember that if you're going to be doing global health and, and you're doing global health in a country that you are not a member of that group, then you are often going to have to take a back seat. And so that comes down to making sure that you have really good local collaborators who you trust and remembering that I was doing my postdoc for this particular project. And so I was very, um, I really wanted to make sure everything went really well and all of that. And sometimes it would make me, I would get a little anxious because I don't speak Mongolian. And so I'd have to turn over some power and control. And so remembering that your way is not always the right way. And if you have a good relationship with your collaborators, you have to trust them. So we all knew where we would wanted to go with things. And so sometimes they would explain to me like, oh, that's not how we do it here. Like, you know, go, you need to be over here or something. And so many times 
my presence is helpful in these situations and other times it's not. And so learning to read the room and learning to take those cues from your collaborators is incredibly important. So um, I know that when we even presented our work to like the Mongolian Ministry of Science to, to get our IRB approval within the country, um, you know, I, I actually sat down and they presented and they let it because they needed, the ministry needed to know that I wasn't just coming in and taking over, taking everything out, that this was a collaborative process. This was going to, and, and also trying to make sure that you're, this is a toughie, but I really try to, to publish open access when I'm doing anything global health related, because the last thing I want is for individuals who this belongs to to not have access to it. But we all know that's also very tricky with the paywalls and things like that. So it's not easy. It takes a lot more groundwork and um, learning to let go of the reins a little bit. That sounds really hard, especially when it's your postdoc project. Yeah, but had I not done it, the, you know, it, it would have been a failure completely because I, there were also times where, um, you know, I was kind of fun for the household. And then there were other times where, you know, I, I went and sat in the car <laughs> because, you know, that household, I wasn't really helpful to them. Um, so yeah, again, social cues and, and learning and having a good team that can kind of give the elbow of like, be quiet, go sit down, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So I had a question. Um, how were these parasites initially identified? So these are, you know, really rural areas. Did they, you know, come in and they had symptoms and then they were tested? How did you even find out that they had this disease? Yeah, we actually didn't diagnose anyone. So that's one of the elements of this study is that, um, you know, it was all just for research. So we took stool, uh, voluntarily collected stool from the um, herder families or the peri-urban um, and, and urban settings. So they provided us the stool and then we took it to the lab and did the PCR on it. Um, Unfortunately, that, that is one aspect of it. We did try to do a comparative kind of look at some of the diarrheal disease patients in the urban hospital, um, but we, we had trouble with um, those samples, just we could never get anything out of them. And so we just, it was kind of a problem with our procedure, probably more than anything. But that was something that would have been nice to know. Um, we did ask some questions related to whether or not people had any symptoms. Um, and we had, we didn't find any connection at all between self-reported symptoms for diarrheal disease and whether or not that somebody in the household actually had a positive. That could be because we had a household member who was kind of the head of the household or who, you know, was an adult providing the survey data. And so they might not have been symptomatic, but yet they provided a stool sample from a, one of their child children who maybe would have been had we asked them, you know, hey, do you have a belly ache or have you had diarrhea? So there, that kind of was also a missed opportunity. So um, yes, that that we're not sure about. Um, but it seemed when we looked it up that there wasn't a lot of self-reported illness within our positive human samples. So interesting because if you don't know you're sick then it's you don't maybe take those extra precautions of washing your hands more or maybe you're not the one who prepares the meal or things like that so you talked a little bit about how the uh fact that these families are nomadic has sort of pros and cons from a public health perspective and a zoonotic disease perspective I'm curious, do you know whether, um, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, how has that played out? Has the ability of families to move, for example, to a more rural setting where perhaps there's, you know, uh, you know, less disease transmission, has that been helpful during the pandemic? I'm just curious if, if that's something that you know about from, from Mongolia. Yes, I have talked a little bit to some friends and colleagues and um, yes, there's also, so there's a big transition between, um, you know, rural to urban migration in terms of, especially young adults, you know, wanting different education opportunities or work opportunities and people just kind of wanting to be a little bit more metropolitan. However, 
there's also every year around the winter time, there's a, there's a lot of pollution in Mongolia. It's a highly polluted country due to the coal burning. Ulaanbaatar as a city is also kind of in a bowl. It made a lot of sense to build the city with um, uh, geographical um, barricades around with mountains. However, the more populated the city got and the more coal, bu coal burning it had to be to keep up with minus 40 degree Fahrenheit winters, the coal po uh, pollution can just like sit and it's just unbearable. So in the winter, it's very common to, for city dwellers to go out and stay with their friends and family or to go out into these different kind of houses out in the countryside to get away from the pollution. So this kind of moving out of the city for certain amounts of time is already kind of built in culturally. And so that was really what happened during COVID. A lot of people who had the ability to get out of the city went and stayed out in the countryside with their family and friends and things like that. So it the COVID rates appear to have been lower than in some other areas. Um, however, um, you know, surveillance and diagnostics might also have, have been a problem. So it's, if you're out in the countryside like that, it's really hard to go in and get care for, um, for diarrhea, let alone for COVID. So we also might have lower rates due to just lack of surveillance. What, what kind of solutions, are, are there solutions that are like sort of could be easy to get to people. Like, for example, I, I feel like I heard, correct me if I'm wrong about this, I feel like I heard that for a guinea worm, which is, you know, passed by a copepod that's infected with the parasite, you give people a straw with a filter at the end and you make sure that, you know, that keeps the copepod out so they don't get infected. But cryptosporidium and giardia are way smaller. Are there like, I mean, you've mentioned the road system is not so good and so it's got to be hard to get back and forth, but are, are there like, solutions that you could drop off at different communities like iodine pills to treat the water or something or or would it just be too expensive and difficult or maybe even the right uh fix doesn't exist i i think that that's the question to ask really is what will work and um, because i've i've thought about this a lot from my standpoint but again i'm an outsider so what i might come up with as a solution could be completely inappropriate or um you know not useful so the idea of the water, I think, is, is kind of the area to look, is where I would recommend where some in-country um, facilitators would be looking. And so if our rural households, moving a giant tank of water that you filled up in the city is not really feasible with the, uh, you have to keep your belongings pretty small if you literally are moving them between, um, you know, areas and you might have a couple um, help with some trucks, maybe some pickup trucks, or you're using your horses to carry this or things like that. So a giant water tank won't work. Um, just hauling water every day won't work because they're, they're pretty far. And as the winter comes, you just really can't access things like that. So I would think the source alone might not be able to change for some of the rural households, but the idea of contamination at the point of use. So if we're looking at that point of use, we can we can do some things there. So we can look at ways in which we can make that point of use safe. So even if they got it from an unimproved source before use, can we do iodine? Can we do some chlorination tabs? Um, what about just doing some better um, awareness campaigns about it to increase the boiling? time and, and things like that before use. So I think um, right there would be a really helpful use and then getting some better hand washing inside. So really kind of promoting that. But again, if you're having to pull water from all these different sources, it, it becomes a luxury. And so you kind of get to be a little bit lax. I would, I, I can understand that. Hannah, did you, uh, Han, sorry, Hannah, did you want to ask another question? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, I guess you sort of answered my question about boiling. It sounds like maybe they're not, they are boiling, but not um, maybe for the correct amount of time for like specific parasites. Um, so I was a little confused about the graph where you had like um, households where only the humans were infected, but then you said it's probably from the water. But was it from the water in those households or was it just an un those like that first really high bar was just it was unclear where they got it. 
Unclear. We do not okay. know. All we know is that for the households that did have a, a positive um, parasite in one of the samples, they were significantly associated with also not having or not using improved water sources. So we had a few connections to in our bivariate analysis, but once we opened it up for that, the larger multivariate, some of it disappeared, which was kind of interesting. Um, so yes, we are not 100% sure. And there is something else that we didn't do, which was quite a bummer. Um, and I'm sure anyone who's ever done research knows that good intentions, we can't always get there. But um, we had really hoped on doing some genotyping of the cryptosporidium. So then our positive um, samples, we could tell if they were, you know, what potentially having a little bit more of an understanding about the host origin for our crypto and then also looking at some of these households that had more than one sample type that was positive to see if it's the same type of crypto. Um, we actually had more Giardia than crypto, which was, um, I was expecting more cryptosporidium, but we had uh, much more Giardia, but um, it would have been nice to know more about the, um, the species of cryptosporidium and then we could possibly see not 100%, but I'm interested in that type of research to try to see if we can look for the direction of the transmission or have a better idea. So are the animals getting it from the people? Are the people getting it from the animals? Are the flies bringing it from your neighbor's house? Like what's, what's actually happening to be the exposures? And so we don't have that information at all. Did you have something, Scott, or can I ask another question? Go for it, Kelly. So I have a question for both uh, Hannah and Amber. So you two are both approaching your problems from like much more complicated systems ways. And like, you know, so, and genomics, you know, you used to have like a candidate gene approach, but now you try to like, look at the whole genome at once to try to figure out, you know, like what is causing the disease. Uh, I guess my first question would be like, so now we're all sort of converging on these systems approaches. It was just like the inevitable march of progress where we all realize you just, things get more complicated and you need to understand it. And in your different fields, are there still people who push back? So like there are still candidate gene people who don't like genome-wide association studies or something like that. Are, are there still people who don't think this is the right approach or is it pretty much accepted uh, in your fields that this complicated way of studying things is the right way to do it. Well, I'll, I guess I'm Amber, on, you go? So, yeah, I'll go first and then I'll mute myself. Um, I, cause my background is not, um, I don't have microbiology. I don't have parasitology. I don't have anything like this. My background's not clinical at all. So for me, I have a bachelor's in communication and I studied TV broadcasting. So when I got into public health, I was already really used to kind of having this hodgepodge background of kind of trying different things and seeing, learning more about myself and all of that. So for me, I already came into it in like almost like a patchwork sense. So for One Health and all of that and looking at it this, um, you know, what can you bring here? And hey, I'm working on this. I know you are. Do you want to, you know, do you want to add some questions to my survey that might help you answer this question? I was already thinking like that. But to the second part of your question, not everybody that has become um, mentors or supervisors or colleagues along the way thinks like that. And so it has been um, oh, interesting for some people whenever I present things or I'm talking about things and then I, I'm always trying to reach out to somebody over here and say, you know, hey, I know that you study this too, like come on board and things. And, and it does, it, it's not always comfortable for everybody who really works in a, a very specific field and they have very unique questions and they're, you know, building, building, building on that, that line of research for me to be like, join the party, that's all, you know, so um, yeah, it's, it also, it leads to more questions. I don't think I'll ever end up with true answers to my research questions. I'm okay with that, but I think that would drive a lot of people crazy. Every time I do anything, it just opens up a million more questions. Sounds like an exciting way to live to me. Yeah, I think um, Kelly, your question is really insightful because it's kind of digging into like 
what it how do your how how does your field do science right um so i think in my field it's partially like an evolution like you know at the beginning it was more stepwise and we'll study one piece at a time and as people realize that the system was really complicated and it wasn't working one way it was like sort of an evolution where now like now people are doing it more in a complicated sense where we're looking at the whole system and maybe like the older professors might be working on you know something that they had started but at the same time i think there's also personality level to it where some people like to do you just based on their personality they like to be very meticulous and go step by step and they're like well i need to figure out this step before i go to this step and then other people are like i just see the whole big picture and i just want to figure out the big picture and then we'll figure out the details later and that's more a personality thing and i think um neither like way is correct but if you have a team of people where like i'm definitely the big picture person where i'm like wow look at this chaos it's so convoluted and messy and i love it and then but then like my colleagues are like hang on, let's like, um, what about this deep, like, you know, like, let's do this thing and then do that thing. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I guess we could do it that way. I kind of want to skip over here first. But so I think if you have a, if like team science really thrives on like having the different approaches, but overall, I will say that like in cancer biology, people have realized that it's, it's not even just the whole cancer, actually, it's the whole organ, like the whole, oh, sorry, organism. So the whole, you have to look at like when you're looking at the immune system, the immune system isn't just there in the tumor, it's like all over your body. So you're actually looking at a systemic disease. So I don't think anyone would argue that like you can't look at the whole system. Um, I think people do appreciate that that's how you have to study it. But as to what they're doing in their lab, they might be taking a more big picture approach or a more like little nitty gritty approach. Um, and they fit together well. You need both. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I, th I think I had been posing my question as a like everybody is moving towards this more complicated thing, but of course there are still people who are drilling down on the details and and I guess we probably all need to be working together and have some people be detail people and some people be big picture people and yeah, something for everyone. So I'm curious how each of you got to the place that you're at now, where these are the questions that clearly you're passionate about and, and, and motivated to, to ask and answer. So Amber, you talked a little bit about your um, background with a, a, a undergraduate degree in communications. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about kind of what your, your path has been, what your journey has been, and how did you get interested in, um, in, in the research that you're doing now? Um, maybe walk us through kind of your your personal journey. And then Hannah, I'd love to hear about yours as well. Mine is definitely non-traditional. And I, I like to use it in whenever I teach now, because I think that a lot of people feel as though, a lot of students in particular, if they didn't know what they wanted to be or do when they were five, then they're behind. And so I think some of us just take a little longer to figure it out. And I was one of those people. I, I, yeah, my, my bachelor's degree is in communication. I had a double minor in um, TV broadcasting and law enforcement, justice administration. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was also part of a investigators kind of club in which we um, would dive into uh, different um, criminal investigations and we had different detectives come in. And so that'll play into something in a minute. Um, and so that was really something I was interested in. And then when I was graduating, I, I was scared of the real world. And so I went to law school for one year, which was not a good decision on my part. Always shadow before you jump into something like that. Um, and then I floundered for a bit. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? I'm not done. I'm not satisfied. I've got to get some work going. What do I do? And I, I kind of did some soul searching and realized, you know, okay, I really do want a job that helps people. I have no clinical background. So do I want to go and start all these classes again to get a clinical degree? Huh, look, here's public health. I see there's a graduate public health. That seems cool. It's communications based and, you know, I get to deal with communities. And then I had my first class that was epidemiology. And I just kind of fell in love. And I was like, this makes so much sense to me. I, it's dealing with people. It's trying to solve problems that will help people, especially the infectious disease side, which is what I like. I like gross and dirty and sexy parasites and infectious diseases. 
Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I was able to get a um, fellowship with um, my state at, as an epidemiologist kind of in training um, for a couple years. So I was able to, when I graduated, I was able to do two years of case investigations and outbreak investigations. And that's where all that detective work came back into play. And then also just, I really love to travel and meet new people and, and have some adventures. And so that's where the global health started to come into play. And some of these problems just really make me so frustrated because you know they're rooted in inequality and racism and all of these different aspects. So you've got all these big ticket items and, and very easy solutions. And where are we going wrong with this? And, and so then I started to kind of pull it all together. And then that's where this notion of One Health makes sense to me because it's it's a real community kind of approach to science and public health and global health and veterinary health and environmental health. And so it's kind of pulling all of my interests together um, into, into this. So it was a winding road, um, but I am just where I need to be. I should have never fought against my nerdiness. I'm full nerd all the way from here on out. Embrace the dork, the inner dork. I love that. I, no, this is what a fascinating story. I feel like that is on the one hand, like a very unique story. And on the other hand, I know so many people that did not have a straightforward pathway to careers that they feel very fulfilling and feels like a good fit for them now. I, I, I try to convey that when I advise undergraduate students, but you know, it's hard when you're, you're just one person to sort of say, it's okay if you, you know, are like me and you don't know what you want to do when you're, when you're young and you, you know, figure it out as you go. But what a, what a great story. Um, thank you for sharing that. Hanna, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah. Um, so my journey was the opposite. When I was five, I was like, I'm going to be a biologist, just like my mom didn't know what it was. Um, I have a visitor. Um, but <laughs> this is not the one in the picture, <laughs> the other one. Um, and so basically I like just wanted to be just like my mom. And then, you know, when I hit actual biology classes, I was like, oh, I should probably figure out if I actually like this thing. Um, and I just found that I had an intuition for it. And I like to ask a lot of questions. And while I was teased for that as a kid, it turns out that, you know, is good for a science career um, and like puzzle solving, which is good for biology. And I don't know, I just felt like it, it clicked with me um, in a way that other sciences like you know, I was good at them in school, but I didn't like have as much of a passion for them. And then um, I guess within biology, I know that some of you work on like, um, you know, uh, parasites, basic biology. And for some reason, like I was gravitated toward like, hey, I want to like cure human diseases. And I think that was just like from the beginning, I was like, what can I apply this to to really like, I don't know, save more people's lives. And I don't really know where that came from per se. I just kind of like gravitated toward it and cancer was like an obvious choice. Um, definitely had some personal connection to it. I feel like everyone knows someone um, who had cancer uh, one way or another. So it kind of just drove me in that direction. And I think at this point, you know, I've, I've got so deep into it and it never got boring. If I, you know, had to pick again, I would maybe con also consider neurodegenerative diseases because that has also affected um, my family and it wasn't at the forefront of my mind, you know, as a college student, cancer was like, oh, cancer, wow. But um, that's another disease that I would be, you know, uh, honored and privileged to work on someday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Love the cameo appearances there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Hannah. That, that, that's great. Now, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's awesome when people get to do exactly the thing that they wanted to do when they were young at the same time, right? That's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. If I had like a, and I won't go into this long, but I feel like I had an intermediate path. Like I sort of knew that I wanted to be biology, but then when I finally got to grad school, I sort of like jumped all over the different things that I was trying. And so like the pinballing didn't really happen until after I like sort of focused in on the sciences and got a little farther along. And I, I feel like I'm still pinballing, uh, but you know, each each different place I find myself, I have some fun, so it's all good. It's kind of the same for me. Like I, I feel like I always wanted to be a biologist, but at the same time, I didn't really know that that was a thing that you could do with your career. Like I knew 
you could be a doctor. And so when I went to college, I figured I was pre-med because I'm, you know, I know you can be a doctor. And that seems to be what a lot of people who like biology do. So I kind of went down that route until I started finding out about research that people were doing in different types of biology. I was like, wait, you can do that? Oh my God, Like I, I need to find out more about that. But at the same time, I would find some new discipline. Like I took anthropology classes and I was like, wait a second, you can do that. And, and, you know, did a deep dive there. And so, yeah, the, the, the pinball, though you said Kelly pinball, the pinball metaphor, like rings true for me as well. And I feel like I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up, you know, but that's, that's awesome when you can just sort of, you know, have the opportunity to explore your interests and, and your passions, right? And and it's kind of what this webinar is all about, right? Like getting to uh, hear from people to you know, find out kind of what what they get excited about and how they've been able to explore their own their own passions. Agreed. I I work with a friend who sort of outlines some stuff we do together, and at the very bottom of it, he always writes inspire humanity, but sort of like leaves blank what what he's going to say. And so I feel like Scott just did the inspire humanity part, and we can now close out for the day. There you go. All right. <laughs> always good to inspire humanity. Wow, that's a lofty goal. Um, <laughs> but I like it. Yeah, well, so this, this was awesome. I had so much fun today. Thank you so much to Hannah and Amber for their awesome talks. Uh, and I hope folks will dork out with us again in the future. And yeah, I had a ton of fun. Thank you very much for having me. I had a great time. Thanks. This Thanks. is awesome. Look forward uh, to the next one. Yeah, please do join us again. And, uh, you know, uh, it's always fun to have people who have, have been uh, panelists and guests come and join us and, and, and send questions. And I know Hana, you've sent a lot of questions in some of our previous talks, so I hope you keep that up. And Amber, we encourage you to come back and, and, and join us and, and submit questions as well. So it's so fun to, to be building this community of dorks. <laughs> totally. All right, dorks. Have... <laughs> Until next time. Bye. 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 Bye.